Wow. Hello, everyone. I'm Dana Perino, along with Kimberly Guilfoyle, Juan Williams, Jesse Waters, and Greg Gutfeld. It's 5 o'clock in New York City, and this is The Five. Immigration front and center again in Washington today as the judicial branch steps into the showdown over Dreamers, a federal judge temporarily blocking President Trump's efforts to end the DACA program, which protects hundreds of thousands who enter the U.S. illegally as children. The White House calls the injunction outrageous. Mr. Trump had some words on the subject earlier today. We want to see something happen with DACA. It's been spoken of for years. The fact is, our country was such a mess, nobody even knows what the numbers are. But we'll know what the numbers are. But above all else, any bill we pass must improve jobs, wages, and security for American citizens. The people who elected us, all of us, the people that elected us, we have to take care of them. The block came hours after the president appeared willing to negotiate a deal to protect young illegals and others from deportation. Democrat Elizabeth Warren claims he's broken America's promise to dreamers, but she says she's willing to work with him. The president has created a crisis for 800,000 young people. Every single day that goes by, young people are losing status, as it's called, which means they are subject to being deported by ICE. It means that they, for some of them, cannot legally show up for work anymore. Right. So the whole notion that we put that off is wrong. Some conservatives don't want to see the president compromise on immigration. Anyone in Washington starts talking about amnesty, legalization of any kind for people that have come into the United States illegally, there is a fresh surge across our border. That's no art of the deal. That's complete surrender. When Kevin McCarthy is the hardliner on immigration in the room, I think we can call this the lowest day in the Trump presidency. Kimberly, one thing yeah. that's curious about this judge's decision in the Ninth Circuit is that when President Obama made the deal with the Dreamers, it was by executive order. Mm -hmm. And today, what you see is that the White House is having to grapple with the, the courts never said that Obama's order could not stand, but they're saying that President Trump's cannot stand, but it is also by executive order. So what do you think of that? I think there's a disparity that's been <laughs> in a bit of hypocrisy. I was just and trying to lead the witness. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Way to lead the witness, always. I rest my case. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be All right, right back. so the, th the thing here is, is that you see that there's always this double standard as it relates to President Trump, but no surprise to you with like the Ninth Circuit, with the travel ban, but everything gets sent back to them because they act in a bad way, and then they say, okay, we're going to send it back to you to actually review it by the proper standards, et cetera. So there shouldn't be a difference because it's the same mechanism by which he is actually putting this forward, just like President Obama did. But because they object to him doing it, they're going to find fault with it, but where they wouldn't otherwise with President Obama. And I think this is what he finds to be, you know, particularly frustrating. And then as relates to the, the conservatives and the right, I believe, Greg, was yesterday you were saying that Ann Coulter would be none too pleased. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by this sure. order. What do you think of all this? Uh, after yesterday, I've decided that I'm self-identifying as a dreamer. Mm -hmm. If Rachel Dolezal can self-identify as black, then I can dream. Seriously, why can't I? They're, Dare to dream, you know, we, uh, There's been more read and said about the dreamers since any group, probably since the Beatles. And I'm sorry to say to John Lennon, Jesus is now more popular than Jesus. That's a Beatles throwback joke for you. Got but um, <laughs> Trump's exposing the sheer partisanship of the, of the Democratic Party. This is all about being out of power because Trump's moving in their direction. This is the most nonpartisan politician you're going to see. And, and Ann Coulter is the proof. The angrier Ann Coulter gets, the more Liz Warren should be happy right. because she's, he's moving away. He wants, it, he wants a deal. And a deal means that he is willing to do Compromise. a lot more. So I don't know what the gripe is anymore. It's it's because it's, it's him. Yeah, it's because it's him. And no matter what he does, it's not his demeanor and it's not his uh, this illusion of dementia they talk about. It's because they are not in power and they don't like him, and that's it. But um, so true. it's not all just because it's him. I mean, on the policy side of things, the conservatives that were expressing disappointment, they are upset about that the policy could change. And I think it really does have to deal with how you define amnesty. Right. So if you give the dreamers uh, the ability to vote, that would be a big problem for a lot of people. I would have a problem with it. That might not even be part of the deal. But a lot of people say 800,000 dreamers now voting probably 
700,000 are going to vote for the Democrats. They're not going to like it. But if you look at the big deal as a whole, border hawks are getting a lot done. Not only are they getting funding for the border wall, they're getting more border agents, more immigration judges. They're getting rid of chain migration, which is basically my, cunny, my cousin Vinny. You know, yeah, you know him, your cousin, your uncle, come on in. That's ridiculous. The lottery system, they're getting rid of that. I mean, you don't, when you don't have a party, you don't have people come in through a lottery. Why are we having people come into the country through a lottery? It doesn't make sense. They're moving it towards a merit-based system. I think conservatives, especially border hawks, if they would take any of these items and put them into a group and say, you know what, but we got to legalize some dreamers, you don't punish this, you know, the son for the sins of the father, they'd take it. Mm. In any deal, you're not going to be happy with 100%. I say on the whole, it's pretty good. And today, this morning, um, Juan, I don't know if you saw Dana Milbank in the Washington Post was talking about how some on the far left and that represent dreamers are actually asking for too much from Democrats and that they should just be supportive of the deal that they're going to get. Well, I think it's a little different. He's saying that United We Dream has been attacking Democrats because Democrats mm -hmm. have been willing to negotiate. For example, right. they approved the extension of the budget deal, which is now going to come up against January 20th. But over the Christmas, New Year holiday, and the Dreamers objected to that and said, wait a second, you promised you were going to stand by us. We shouldn't be a bargaining chip. Mm -hmm. so, but they have directed their ire at Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and the Democrats for not being more vociferous, more aggressive in taking on the president on this issue. Because as you heard them say, it was the president's decision last December to end DACA. And from the Dreamers' perspective, that created an artificial crisis. We could be having a discussion about the dreamers without the idea of a, a March deadline with, when they would be forced out technically. And of course, when you stop and think about that, it's true. Now, the problem here, I think, is twofold with this decision. One, I disagreed with you leading my most honorable witness. <laughs> I just couldn't believe it. You know, I want to stand up for her. Because, in fact, the court didn't speak to whether or not there was any legitimacy to an executive order. This was about Donald Trump's tweets. Donald Trump said in a tweet, that dreamers are good, educated people, accomplished young people. They have jobs. They're in the military. Why would we kick them out? The judge in San Francisco then says, well, that sounds like the chief executive, whose job it is to make a judgment here, thinks this is in the public interest. It's up to the Congress, the Congress to set the laws. But as we stand now, we think the public interest is served by what the president said. Mr. President, you get your wish. Don't kick out the dreamers. But Perhaps what this all does is force Congress to actually not just have to worry about the president's deadline, but that there's now a, a court situation. So you have Republicans and Democrats, Kimberly, who came together yesterday, and now uh, maybe there's more pressure on them to actually get it done. Yeah, and I think that's what we're talking about here, you know, yesterday as well, is just like, negotiating and being able to try to come together. This is something that President Trump excels at, and he wants to put a little bit of pressure a little bit of, you know, a foot on the pedal, give it a little bit of gas to make sure that Democrats are also going to try to engage. And it's fascinating, isn't it? Because you see, like you said, Dana, the people on the right getting very upset about some of this, saying it's too much of a giveaway. This was not, it's inconsistent with uh, the campaign. So you've got, you know, vocal opponents on this side, like we saw. And then you have some Democrats who still don't seem to be happy enough with allowances that he's making that, in fact, are in direct accordance with what they were supporting. Mm -hmm. So, but if he's going to get the deal done, and the objective of this is to get a deal done, whether it was immigration or anything else, you know, DACA, Dreamers, whether it's on taxes, whether it's on health care, he wants to get it done. So what can he give and pressure to try to get yeah. them over and to Greg, his level? What, who does a president need to persuade, or how could he persuade uh, people to support a compromise? Well, the funny thing about a compromise, the, the, the evidence of a compromise is when everybody is unhappy about a deal, right? That means that they didn't like get everything. They didn't about get everything. So if, if, if nobody gets everything they want, that means somebody gave up something. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you're seeing. You're seeing, you're seeing Ann Coulter in, in, on, the hard, on the hard immigration side, and you have uh, the Democrats, mm -hmm. and everybody's ticked off about something. That's what happens in a negotiation in a deal. However, I don't, I, I don't, I don't go for deals for the sake of a deal. I mean, that's, and we were like, we talked about that with taxes. He just wanted a tax deal, but we didn't, in its initial stages, we weren't pleased with it because it was, it just felt like he wanted a deal. Yeah. But, but that, but, and, but now it, it's kind of happening. And we kind of, we kind of knew this is, you know, Bannon's gone. He's got more room to play. 
Well, we'll see. I mean, right now there's lots of concern that, in fact, you know, Bannon's acolytes in the White House continue to block the deal, but by insisting on the wall, because just today we saw Jesse. that immigration people crossing that the border now is at a 45-year low. But he continues. He's the to wall. Say, He's fine. <laughs> okay, well, fine. But then you don't need all these the billions for an actual wall. Well, so no, let's make no. a deal. That's the, the based on the promise, and the, the premise is based on the promise. And the statistics the show that fulfilled. just this last month, a thousand illegal aliens were caught crossing yes, per day. Yes, per day. And just, those are just the ones that have gotten caught. And I'm sure another thousand are slipping by. So the wall you complained yesterday that it was too expensive. I think it's I thirty I think it's billion a dollars. Money. $30 billion. I looked it up. Yeah. Medicare, each year they spend about $600 billion. What are you comparing the wall to Medicare? $600 billion. Let me get $30 this billion is a drop let in the get, bucket let me get compared this to that. Taking care of people who are American citizens who are in need of medical care is this equivalent of well, a wall? You could, you Stopping illegal aliens end up hurting people and putting them in the hospitals. Oh Look, I, is I'll also tell you what. very important. You know what? We report, you decide, audience. You tell, <laughs> wow. Yeah, okay. I think the audience <laughs> is going to go here. Yeah, I don't think so. I think people know that if they need Start medical care, they want security. Oh, yeah, we do. What I'm saying to you, you no, what I'm saying to you is the Democrats, and this goes back to what you were proposing earlier. Well, Let's have a reasonable discussion. The Democrats want the Dreamers to stay. I think actually President Trump wants the Dreamers to stay, but they're willing to negotiate in terms of added boots on the ground on the border, more security in terms of the drones, the aircrafts, the electronic surveillance. But then Trump comes out and says, "No, no, no." We got to have the wall because he wants to fulfill this. And yeah, because this he's a good negotiator. Problem. No, because well, and if I that's guarantee the case, you're going to really have wall sincere. funding and the dreamers protected. Well, you, I'm all well, for it. What will end up happening is that he'll call it wall funding, and the Democrats will say it's more border security, yeah, and everybody will just go home. And it's how you brand it. But the, the other thing about you know this wanting the dreamers to stay only became an argument now, which means that Donald Trump made that a chit. He made that something to negotiate yeah. over, which is now allowing him to make progress on enhancing border control, no matter what you call it. it. So he actually Bannon made move? something, what? I think it was a Steve Bannon move. Yeah, it might genius. have been, it's, he, is, he is a genius. genius. But it, I mean, here was something that was kind of just understood to just be there. Now is kind of like, well, maybe it isn't. And now you have a negotiation. Well, I think that's right. But that's why the Democrats say he created an artificial crisis, but he did it in your description, yeah. I think aptly, as a negotiating tool. But the thing is now, we're up against it. And so you get people like Coulter and, right. and Mark Levine and others saying, hey, wait a minute, this is not what you promised in the campaign. But he said I he would take the you. heat. Yeah. He said he likes Loves heat. His whole life's been Who doesn't different. love heat, especially in this especially wintry <laughs> weather? It's yeah. quite cold out. It's I gotta tell you, 30 is the new 70. It really is. <laughs> All right, when the five returns, a big thank you from South Korea to President Trump for helping bring North Korea to the table. Right back with a Greg Alog. After Donald Trump hosted a historic bipartisan televised meeting, Mika Brzezinski and her ventriloquist dummy Joe said it was <laughs> awesome. Nah, they trashed it. This was nothing more than a dog and pony show where he was using Democrats and Republicans to try and show that he was fit when, in truth, he actually showed that he had very little command of the issue. Really funny. All right, so he's vilified for being partisan, vilified for being bipartisan, vilified for not compromising, vilified for compromising, and all by the same talking heads. So who sounds mentally unbalanced now? Anyway, how do you know when you're losing an argument, when you can't even give just a little bit of credit to your foe? Confidence is shown when you're willing to say when the other guy scores, but there are others who can't. Check out this haircut. Just days after the release of that bombshell book, Fire and Fury, that claimed some closest to the president have questioned the president's fitness to lead, an extremely rare event playing out on television today. Reporters and cameras invited into a bipartisan meeting on immigration playing out for 55 minutes on television, showing America the president at work. Yeah, I'm sure that guy reads a ton. He subscribes to International Moose and Gel Monthly. He has amazing hair. Have you ever seen that? Amazing. Amazing. Really, amazing. But at least, Jesse Waters. But oh, at least wow. one person gave Trump credit. The accomplishment of South-North dialogue was largely credited to President Trump. I would like to express gratitude to him. Isn't that sweet? Moon is over the moon. Now, he could be saying it to flatter Trump, knowing he's a sucker for it, but so what? 
What would you rather have, a president who seeks credit for a job well done or one willing to look the other way when a terror group might muddle his legacy? Now, here's something else Trump's not getting credit for. The Small Business Optimism Index is at a record high. You can, you can tell because of the green arrow. See, it's going up. I'm thinking oh small God. business optimism is a decent barometer of job approval, more so than what the media or polls tell you. Both get more wrong than right these days. Fact is, small businesses thrive in good times, and now they sense good times. And I should know, I'm a small piece of business myself. Uh -huh. uh, let's talk about it. Donald Trump commented on his own meeting. It was vintage Trump. Let's roll that. My performance, uh, you know, some of them called it a performance. I consider it work. But got great reviews by everybody other than two networks who were phenomenal for about two hours. <laughs> then after that, they were called by their bosses and say, oh, wait a minute. And unfortunately, a lot of those anchors sent us letters saying that was one of the greatest meetings they've ever witnessed. And they were great for about two hours. They were phenomenal. And then they went a little bit south on us, but not that bad. So, Jesse, <laughs> yesterday you had this kind of amazing moment, and then you have this, which is vintage. They sent him letters. <laughs> letters, and the letters got there the next day. That's pretty quick mail. Um, I could, how could yeah. you not love that? I mean, it was, I it was it. great, and, and it wasn't, it was, it was performance, but it, I mean, it was work. I mean, it was work, not a performance. <laughs> I thought it was great, but this is just the media obsessed with the president's style and not his results. Mm -hmm. You remember he got mocked for the whole fire and fury and the sanctions. Now they're talking north and south. Yeah, yeah. He got mocked for saying he wants to bomb the hell out of ISIS. Now the caliphate's gone. Remember he said he wanted the NATO members to pony up. Everyone said, oh, he's going to pull out of NATO. Eh, what happened? They ponied up. So the tax cuts, too. Remember, this is all going to be for the rich. Now millions of people get a $1,000 bonus. <laughs> come Christmas time. So the workers did benefit. So I wish just the media would be fair. And, you know, you can knock him on the style because the style is sometimes a little erratic. But to his credit, the results are there, and he's going to be judged by those results come election day. Dana, this, I, I came across the small business uh, index. I won't say where. But uh, okay. uh, Scott Adams' blog. <laughs> oh, here we go. Wow. Yeah. Great. But, <laughs> yes. but there's a story conveniently overlooked. That's kind of a big deal, right? Well, I mean, I don't know. We, I feel like the economy is covered every single day. But and... I, this is the first I ever heard of the small business index being at an all-time high. Shouldn't that be all over the place? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Now you can now you can go on My and talk about anything God. else. Um, no, I mean you the economy is him. obviously fully recovered, and people are seeing the benefits of it. And I, I you know, it, it, part of it is just a feeling. Mm -hmm. you, I mean, as much as you want for someone to actually get um, credit and and say like, yes, you got credit, you got credit. There, there is that, but it's more important that people actually feel it. And mm -hmm. I think that when the economics catches up with the people's feelings about the tax cuts, that the Republican Party and President Trump will benefit. But most importantly is that the worker benefits, especially if wages start to go Correct. up. Mm -hmm. Kimberly, so I, uh, I know that Juan thinks that the whole North Korea thing was just baloney, but that was pretty... Guess what? <laughs> oh. <laughs> but <laughs> why question the intent? It's yeah. better. I mean, like, if that how didn't happen. A, how is this a bad thing? Yeah, that's I don't what... understand. Like, yeah. why well, can't it might just, be. Like, except, well, no, I think it's good that he's getting praise because we're saying, look, we're working cooperatively, and ultimately we want to go against North Korea and get them to knock it off. So the more partnerships that we have and coalition building and support that is vo uh, verbalized internationally, I think it's very good for the United States. I think it's something that's very powerful and that's something that the president can use as an asset. I see it from that perspective in terms of, okay, give me your voice on this so that we can then spread the word. So mm -hmm. it's not just the president always having to like stand alone on this. You know, Juan, if you just admit that there are one or two good things about your adversary, doesn't it make your other criticism look more valid? I like, think so. Okay, so there, here's your chance. One, oh. one or two things, Juan. There we go. Maybe yeah. just one. Okay. I, th I love your hair. Thank you. Not about <laughs> me. Oh, 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 oh. Who has better hair? Well, Him no, or, I don't or know. Muir? What's his I, name? David Muir? Muir? Yeah. What about what Trump's Muir. hair is pretty good, man. Yes, it, it good. is. And it's good. real. Is it real? It's all real. Yeah. Oh, because there you were lots of hair? reports of like oh. surgeries and comb overs, but you think it's real. Well, I know it's real. I've seen someone. If you want to focus television. on Trump's hair rather than deal with these incredible victories, I understand. No, because you know what? 
you. You had the right notion, which was flattery will get you everywhere. Mm -hmm. And with Trump, that's proven every day. So what you get is President Moon, who has said previously, Over we should be negotiating with the North. We yeah. want the United States, and we want to talk with them. The president said, don't do it. He imposed those sanctions, et cetera, to punish right. them. Now, here comes President Moon, and he says, oh, you know what, Jesse? You're just, your hair is just divine. You just look, <laughs> you look marvelous. So what and kind he of accent was that but, long? But I don't know. But I'll he take it. But he distracts Jesse, my friend Jesse, no. from the fact that is suddenly the alliance, which was the U.S. and South no. Korea against North Korea, is now they divided. They hadn't been speaking since 2015. Correct. And because of the fire and fury rhetoric and because of those tough no. sections, the North now came oh, to the table oh, and yeah. are now speaking oh, yeah. with the South. Oh, yeah. That's a good thing. You know what's interesting here is that Greg would suddenly be looking at that... I don't want to insult the guy, but what did Trump call him? The little nut or something? Oh, a rocket man? Little man? rocket yeah. man. Now, little suddenly, man. suddenly the little rocket man is the one who's going to determine whether or not Trump right. is a good negotiator. Come on, guys. Give me a break. Be honest. So there have been no sanctions? No enhanced? Uh, China has not taken... Let me oh, tell you, you. None of this stuff happened in They're the fantasy world. Oh, did China come along? Has China really pushed I hard? Think oh, wait, no. Exports to, from China to uh, North they're, Korea they're down declined. 30%. Yeah, but remember when the chocolate cake was on the breakfast table and we said, oh, yeah, we've got it. Now, China is going to really hit them hard. Now, he says China hasn't done enough. That's what the the president says. That's good. Oh, you well, should no, be no, saying no. that. You want the president of <laughs> right. China to do more. Right. He's Never good enough pressure. for one. He's president Trump tearing into sneaky Diane Feinstein. That's his word as the dossier drama deepens ahead. <laughs> sneaky. Enough is enough. President Trump's personal lawyer taking legal action against that, quote, fake Russian dossier, suing Fusion GPS, the firm behind it, and BuzzFeed, which published the uncorroborated document on the president and his campaign. Michael Cohen alleges false and defamatory allegations have resulted in harm to the president's reputation. Mr. Trump unleashed some fury today on Senator Dianne Feinstein for releasing testimony of Fusion GPS co-founder Glenn Simpson, quote, the fact that sneaky Dianne Feinstein, who has on numerous occasions stated that collusion between Trump and Russia has not been found, would release testimony in such an underhanded and possibly illegal way, totally without authorization, is a disgrace. Must have tough primary. Feinstein's response? Does, uh, does it offend you when the president <laughs> meant to call you shady in a tweet? I know you're, you're well, he sneaky, tends sorry, to sneaky. call people names very quickly, so I'm not alone. Okay, so Sneaky Diane, that's a great nickname. Yeah. But what do you think about this new lawsuit? All right, here's something interesting. So yesterday, this 312-page document drops, and everybody's running around. Oh, my God, this is, this is the biggest story. Thank you, Diane. That was on Twitter. Every, every reporter was, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now it's the next day. Where the hell is the breaking news? All these, all this hoopla and hosannas over heroism of Diane, and there's not, this story is like a blow-up doll. It's inflated and disappointing. All right. Well, Juan yesterday. Wow. Why would said, you even, um, how would you even know that? Well, I'm, I'm glad you raised this point. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, right. That's what everyone wants to know. Oh my God. Know. The witness has damaged oh. us. Yeah. <laughs> Destroyed. <laughs> okay, moving on from Bill Adal <laughs> on to the dossier, which there were some interesting connections there. Overlap. Juan said yesterday that the dossier was, some of it was true. Our brain room looked at it, Juan. Oh, my God. <laughs> Here comes some punishment, Juan. Is the dossier accurate? There has been no public corroboration of the salacious <laughs> allegations against Mr. Trump, nor of the specific claims about coordination between his associates and the Russians. So, Juan, you were fact-checked by your own company, <laughs> and you got four <laughs> Pinocchios. Oh, is that right? Now you must be removed. <laughs> That'd be great. Removed. Uh, but I would think what they said was not corroborated, okay. right? And so that's true. They didn't say it was wrong, which is what you are suggesting. Okay. So, so, so UFOs exist because they haven't been corroborated. No, 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 but that's a, that would be spec. There's no speculation here. I think everyone can agree. None. The document suggested that Russia was out to interfere in the election, damage the U.S., damage our role on the world stage. And they did that. And secondly, that they were making available well, negative information on one candidate in order to aid 
Donald J. Trump. actually just said that there was a line of communication between oh, yeah. the Kremlin and the Trump campaign, and I don't think well, I don't think there's any question that at all. I don't think there's any question that we saw a Russian lawyer in Trump Tower just down the street here meeting with Don Jr. Did you, did you miss that? That wasn't in the oh, dossier. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, oh, okay. Kimberly, <laughs> I see. do you think, you know, slapping BuzzFeed and uh, GPS with this lawsuit, it's a $100 million lawsuit, do you think that's going to have any effect? I think this is what, you know, President Trump does, and his lawyers are very aggressive. They've been successful in the past when they've brought suits, um, when also when the First Lady was uh, maligned and yes. defamed, and then they did get a settlement there. So if it's something he cares about, it might also be obviously a bit of a legal, you know, tactic, et cetera, but he's putting himself on the record to say that this was, um, you know, incorrect and that this was inappropriate, and so he wants to call him out to task. I mean, this, this is what he does. This, he's done this, like, would that open him up to discover? Would that require discovery then? Yeah, well, that's the other edge of the sword. You can do this, and right. then what happens is you can compel discovery back on the other side, unless at some point he decides to drop it or it goes away. I'm sure they have a strategy because they wouldn't risk, I would assume, exposing themselves to that kind of reciprocal discovery. But I just show think me yours, it might I not, show you mine. I, I just don't, don't you think this what? might not go in here? Because, I mean, he's the president, and Michael Cohen is his lawyer. So they're very public people, and I don't understand how, therefore, there's any grounds. Well, because you're saying that the president, well, he wasn't the president then, but Donald Trump hired prostitutes, and they peed on oh, his oh my God. Jesse? bed oh my in a hotel room. Oh, oh look, look. And oh that was the allegation <laughs> in the document. Oh, that's the most that's serious allegation. That's slanderous and salacious and has, <laughs> would, I think, bring a lot of harm to someone's reputation. That's uh, why I think you slap him with a lawsuit. Uh, that's the most serious allegation? Well, that was the one that got a lot of buzz in oh, the yeah. BuzzFeed article. <laughs> Dana, uh, wrap it up with class. This for doesn't... Us. <laughs> yeah, Dana, why don't you okay, do your best so to fix one that? of the things that happened is that Senator Grassley, who yeah. is the counterpart to Dianne Feinstein, um, his complaint about the leak was that He's, he wasn't necessarily concerned <laughs> about what was going on. <laughs> oh, jeez. He wasn't concerned about God. what it might say about the president. That he was concerned that it would dampen the, op the possibility that other <laughs> witnesses would come, former, would come forward and testify. Help me out here, people. <laughs> and that would include, oh, in his God. words, Jared Kushner. Yeah. Kim Strauss of the Wall Street Journal, who's written a lot about this and is super critical of Fusion GPS, and not, I'm not necessarily saying for not for good reason, she finally said today, this is all silly. What we should try to do is have... Anything that can be declassified in that dossier, just release it all so that the leaking back and forth stops. <laughs> and I'll stop there. Okay, with that. <laughs> you all. And that is how the five cleans it up. <laughs> uh, on actor Robert De Niro. He lost it again last night, kind of like us, unleashing another epic <laughs> expletive filled rant up next. There was barely a mention of President Trump by his haters in Hollywood at Sunday's Golden Globe Awards. That wasn't the case last night at a different awards show where Bobby De Niro went wild. Oh. Hopefully there weren't any children in the audience. The world is suffering from the real Donald Trump. This <laughs> idiot is the president. It's the emperor's new clothes. The guy is a fool. Our baby in chief has... <laughs> In chief, I call him, <laughs> has put the press under siege. All right, what happened there? Uh, that's what happens when an actor doesn't. I mean, that's why they have scripts, <laughs> right? <laughs> it, 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 the great thing about Robert De Niro is you, he's such a great actor when he was younger, and he's just, it, it's too bad. I wrote De Niro into my uh, iPhone when we were to pitch the story, and it came out as denial. You know, it corrected for denial, which makes sense because his emotional perspective is causing him to deny the world in front of him. If you cite facts about what's going on, he thinks we're in this dystopian hell. It, it, things have never been better, but he can't see that. But I will, I will add in his defense, something like five years ago, I saw an actor of equal magnitude of him, as big as he is, say pretty vicious stuff about Obama. And it was, it, it, so this emotional irrational door can swing both ways. You know, it's when you let, you know, when you let, when, when your mind is clouded by emotion, that's what you see. And any sensible person, when you look at that, you just go, he's not doing well. It's not a good, it's not a good look for you, De Niro. 
feel yeah. bad. All right. You, what do you think, Dana? Well, I, th I thought that the restraint at the Golden Globes was actually quite welcome, and it served them well, uh, given that that night could have turned into something kind of like this. Because you and like civility. Oh, I love civility. Yes, you do. Oh. Civility's oh, no. overrated. We can tell you think so. <laughs> <laughs> I have. I have anything else about De Niro? <laughs> I don't have anything else about De Niro denial. Oh, okay, yeah. All right, Jesse, I, what I, can you say? I, I don't have anything else about De Niro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, um, <laughs> tell, us some, tell us more about the dossier. <laughs> I'd appreciate it. Where do we start? <laughs> oh, um, my God. <laughs> depends on what I have to say about... No, I, I want to talk about De Niro, and I think that if this had been a guy, like Greg said, if he was going after President Obama like this, he'd never work again. So there's a huge double standard. Second of all, I love this guy, and it's sad to see him kind of come unglued on television. I don't know if it's his age. I hope it's not his age, but... You know, he shouldn't be speaking like this in public. Um, and he's speaking about just not the president. It's the office of the presidency that he's insulting. And he should know better than that. And it's not a very intellectual argument. So for someone that's supposed to be this very cultured actor who's won all these awards and, you know, he's a great actor and he, you know, hangs in very, you know, high circles, to speak like he's a 17-year-old just kind of ruins his reputation for a lot of people. And I think even liberals that hate the president and hate his policies look at someone like that up on the lectern and say, you know what, that doesn't make our side look good at all. It's not the first time that he's done this as well, Juan, where he's just gone on a, a rant and said stuff about President Trump and uh, De Niro, you know, big buddy of Harvey Weinstein. And yeah, he said Amazon. he wanted to punch him in the yeah. face or one that point. And Amazon had a, they waste like $40 million on doing some film thing with him, and then after the Harvey Weinstein thing, psh, maybe he's angry, he's cranky. Well, if he's genuinely concerned about the country, he has a right. I think he has... Sure he does. He should speak out. And say that he has concerns. And, you know, obviously, Donald Trump has his own issues, everything from women to policies that we've been talking about. And you, how can you not? I mean, Greg acknowledged that people on the right said some very harsh, ugly things about people on the left. Name one person Ted of the Nugent. caliber. Ted of Nugent. the caliber. I'm just I, I, know, I, I was oh. present when one actually said that he had proof. That uh, that Obama wasn't born here. Yeah, and it, was I mean, just, it was like it was pretty. Yeah, it, and terrible. I would say this guy is right up there with De Niro. <laughs> yeah, well, really? he's a, so, he did that I, video. Yeah, I'm going to punch him in the face in October. So well, this is like you know he's just building. He's but you know what? So the, remember that this was an award. So Meryl Streep won for her role as Catherine Graham. Meryl who? Meryl Streep. Street. 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 All right. As, yeah, as her, her role as Catherine Graham in this movie, yeah. The Post. That nobody's seen. And that what he and what he said was he talked about Nixon being someone who was delusional, narcissistic, and petty. And then he said, ah, the good old days oh. uh, compared to Donald <laughs> Trump. I thought that was pretty funny. He should have stuck with that material. The offensive stuff really did go over the top. Right. Okay, we can cut. We can cut. I had a new mirror that will tell you everything that's wrong with you. Would you buy it next, mirror mirror? Magic mirror on the wall. Who is the fairest one of all? Famed is thy beauty, Majesty. But hold. A lovely maid, I see. It's not just in fairy tales that mirrors can talk. Ah, the 21st century. There's actually now a new smart mirror out that critiques your face, pointing out all your wrinkles and flaws and pimples. Uh, Greg, would you really <laughs> want to hear it? The wow. gizmo went on display at a tech show in Las Vegas this week. So since I'm picking on my pal, go ahead. All right. You know what this is? Where this is going? Machines are better than humans at almost everything, including diagnosing and illnesses. This is going to end up being like Waze for mysterious moles. You know how Waze finds the best street to go down? The, the machines are going to crowdsource information and find out if you've got something on your face that might not be healthy. Humans are so fallible. Humans aren't. There's no emotion that clouds your, a machine's mind. You know the judges, their, their decisions on parole are affected by their appetites. This never happens with machines. Machines should be judges. Machines can crowdsource information. This is just another part where AI is going to capitalize on our insecurities. By the way, we don't need a mirror to tell us how we look. We have Twitter. All right. Yeah. All right. They so tell Kimberly. us everything. No Kimberly. Kimberly. Yes, I have gained weight. <laughs> I am trying to lose weight. Wow. I am trying to lose weight. Just stop it. Oh, my God. It works, though. They Wait. shame me. You look marvelous, darling. Thank Nobody you. Nobody says that about you. All right. So, Kimberly, <laughs> uh, 
you look in the mirror, and the way it works is... I like it. It, it, <laughs> analyzes, I know. Like it, it. it says, oh, Kimberly, you have a dry patch here today. Kimberly, you need more concealer under the eye. Kimberly, uh, here, we can even put you at a beach scene. Now, try on this outfit, Kimberly. Let's see Wait. how you look at the beach. Where are you going with this? <laughs> <laughs> says, I'm a, would you like it? Would you this like it? Long how do you look at the beach, Kim? How did you go from that to me and the beach? Because they do that. Like, the, yeah, the mirror. In a bikini. They've got, they've got the mirror is at the beach. With the, the idea bikini. is the mirror, the mirror now interacts with you. Okay, well, that's fine. If you want to come to the beach with me. And, no, no, no. The idea is that you would decide, oh, should I wear this, this outfit or that outfit? Yeah, I, I, whatever. I have no problem with this. I mean, if you want to do a little experiment, a little, like, uh, mirror off between me and Greg, it would be cool. What do you right, think, Greg? Greg? Yes. I think I'm self-critical enough that I don't need this mirror. <laughs> what could it say about you, really? I don't know. Oh, God, probably plenty. So, Jesse, you spent a lot of time in front of the mirror. <laughs> what about it? Juan, how do you know that? Well, because I have reports. You do? Yes, I, I went to you the brain sources room. sources in the, yeah. the brain room. <laughs> yeah, you're, not very pop, you're not popular. His face yeah. is, like, burned <laughs> into the mirror in the, in the makeup what room. What do you think of this? Do you like it? <laughs> I mean, yeah. It could tell me if when I cut my head during Black Friday, if that's healing <laughs> properly, because apparently it's not. Really? Oh, yeah, it's not healing very well. Oh, okay. Really? Still there. No, can you see it? Still well, there. I can it's see a major it. Gash. I think it's actually better than it was. That's because I have a ton of makeup on. I know, but why don't you use that thing, the, like the Derma Blend thing? The yeah, powder. I have that. I put it on every night. Okay, good. You know what? Don't worry about it. You're looking great. Thanks, Juan. One more thing up next. Beautiful girls all over the It's time for one more thing. Kimberly. Thank you so much. Tina. Oh, yes, you're very welcome. So civil. Appreciate the opportunity. So civility. Be quiet, Greg. All right, look in the mirror, Greg. Okay, so I want to celebrate something that is very fantastic. I love programs like this because I love the U.S. military, and this is a really unique program that takes those that have been highly trained and skilled and have served this country. It's the Hero Veteran Program that combats child sex trafficking. And January is National Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month, and our government found an amazing way to help fight against online child sexual exploitation. Mm. So the human exploitation Rescue Operative or HERO program is designed for wounded, injured, and ill transitioning service members and veterans. So they receive extensive training, high tech computer forensics, law enforcement to assist federal agents in the fight to protect children. And a spokesperson for the program said, quote, when it comes to hunting those who prey on the innocent, who better than our nation's most highly trained military veterans. I, I love this program. It's innovative, it's changing lives, and it's putting Excellent. away bad guys. Indeed. Uh, Greg. All right, my podcast is up with Ben Shapiro. You're not going to want to miss this. It's at foxnewspodcast.com. We talk about Bannon leaving Breitbart, where uh, both uh, myself and uh, Ben had worked at, and he's, he doesn't mince any words. He says it word? quickly. He says it very fast, talks very fast. Speaking of time for something new, call it a day. All right, uh, yesterday. Uh, we were celebrating uh, Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. And what did convicted spy Chelsea uh, Manning do? Uh, she went onto Twitter and wrote, F the police. Whoa. Followed by hashtag disarm the police and hashtag we got this. I don't know about you guys, but I'm starting to think maybe Chelsea does things to get attention. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they have, we'll they have a sm I don't know. I, I might question her intent behind uh, her crimes. I don't think she might have been a whistleblower. I think she just might have been an unstable, attention seeking person. And I think it's time for her to call it a day, you meaning a retire from Twitter, go get a real job, you know? That's pretty cool. I like Hashtag that. Hashtag get a real job. Yes. Good All right. Work. Jesse. All right. So it's been very cold, as many of you know, out here recently. And there was a guy in Virginia who had an epic fall <laughs> down his driveway. I just has been watched 33 million times. Oh, God. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. Yes. That's so that was bad. That's Tim so bad. Bessicker, Black Ice got him oh. in his driveway. He was trying. He was trying hard. <laughs> Down goes Tim. So he could have really hurt him. He's okay. When are the services? He's okay. Yeah, we're making fun of this he's poor okay. dead man. No, he's right. fine. And also, I'm going to be on Hannity tonight, mm. and 
I have no idea what we're going to talk about. <laughs> Probably that dog. Nothing new for you. <laughs> <laughs> Just going to wait. Make sure you read the material before dossier. you get there. Yeah. 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 Make sure you read it. Yeah, yeah. You should, barely scratch the you surface. You should check your email. You may have been canceled. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to go. Uh, we got a new podcast too. It's I'll tell you what, and this is the we talk about the new Tom Wolf book called The Kingdom of Speech, in which he just lashes mm -hmm. into Charles Darwin and Noam Chomsky, which was kind of fun to read. Um, also, here's this: the Mustache of the Year awards every year. Wall grooming sends. They're called mustacheologists and beardisticians across the country in search of the wall man of the year. Well, they found it in Detroit, Jason Hine. Hine's advice for perfect facial hair, one has to be strong enough to go three months without touching it, no trimming, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Governor Rick Snyder called him a tireless ambassador for the city and one of our great Michiganders. Uh, our own Geraldo was very disappointed. Wasn't even runner up. Oh. He did not make the cut. But he's our favorite guy with the mustache. That's a great picture of him. All right, here's a video I want you to watch. It's a video of a Louisiana teacher who was teacher of the year in 16 getting manhandled by city marshals oh, yeah. for expressing her opinion. What are you doing? Don't. Can you explain? Are you kidding me? Stop resisting. I am not. Stop you just resisting. pushed me to the floor. This is just outrageous. Denisha Hargrave objected to a pay raise for the superintendent at a school board meeting, noting increases in class sizes and no raises for teachers in 10 years. And while speaking, after right. being acknowledged, they, th well, they threw her out. Well, we got special report up next.